Okay, first we're going to start with the confusion, what I've called the confusion of your life and your teachings and the reason for this. <laughs> yeah. Over the last 2,000 years, I googled and found out that there, uh, there are now over 3,800 um, different denominations of Christian religion. Of Christian religion. <laughs> so it's apparent that there is a bit of confusion as to what is important. And disagreement. <laughs> and disagreement, yeah. Um, and historically, sometimes their disagreements got quite intense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, you've stated that much of the biblical account of your life and teachings are false, inaccurate, not complete, misinterpreted, and in some cases even deliberately deleted. Yeah, and deliberately modified in some cases, yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I've said that probably the first attempt to get a consensus in the Christian world as we know it was the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD yeah. by the Roman Emperor Constantine, yeah. who you've described as a fairly violent man. Well, he uh, he had he had large aspirations to power, of course, and um, as did most Roman emperors. But also, he was quite a clever man, so he could see that the fragmentation of the Roman Empire was a, not only just about uh, secular issues, but also about religious issues. And so he wanted to pull the Roman Empire back into a one, one empire, and he felt the way to do that is by unifying politics with religion. So he invited about, it says about 1,800 bishops from the All Roman together. Empire. Yeah. And about... 300 turned up, showed up. That's correct, yeah. The but, rest were all upset <laughs> with the whole concept. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, the, many of the ones who were upset with the whole concept never came and therefore got never, never got included in the, yeah. in the final decisions. Yeah. And even, even the end result, the end result was not what you'd call a democratic process. No, no, not at all. And, in fact, uh, many of the times... Um, there was quite strong bickering even amongst the final decision makers um, as to what they should include in the canon, the Bible canon, and also what they should inc include as to what are the primary doctrines of Christianity. So there was often quite a lot of discord and, and quite murderous intent at times between the mm. people who were present. Yeah. Now the main issue there seemed to be the divinity of Christ. Yes, uh, so a concept that had slowly developed after my death because no one after my death could mirror my condition. And so they then started the, the concept among even just general Christians who followed the basic teachings of Christianity that I taught. They started to consider that perhaps it wasn't possible for the average person to ever become divine in the sense that I was teaching. And so what they finished up doing was modifying quite a number of the uh, teachings to suit their new concept that it was impossible for them to become divine as I, I had encouraged them to become. So mm -hmm. they, they started to infiltrate the teachings with these concepts that it wasn't, that there was something unique and special about myself that, that others could not mirror. And eventually that grew into, into... And there was also other issues of competition with other people who were the so-called gurus of different religions of part, in times past. Mm -hmm. And they, they finished up amalgamating, in fact, many and, and absorbing many of the concepts that surrounded the, the legends about those particular people mm -hmm. into my life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. To create God on earth. Yeah. Was this to appease the Jews? Was this to get on side with the Jews? No, it was a, to relate. It, to there them? was an attempt to appease almost every other religious faith. So, mm -hmm. um, so not just the Jews, but also uh, many of the uh, teachings of Hinduism and Buddhism uh, and other religions were all attempted to inc be incorporated. Or the the founders of such religions, I was compared to the founders of those religions. And when it was found my life was too ordinary, my life was then modified <laughs> to suit the uh, to be competitive with the founders of those particular faiths. Okay, so so even in three hundred years, you had been elevated to a state of godlike status. 
Yeah, well, that that occurred very shortly after my death, actually. So, so even in the first hundred years, um, this elevation of myself mm. into a, sort of like a godlike state that that then was unattainable by anyone else mm. um, was something that was presumed, and uh, then got incorporated into the copyists' revisions of the because of course every every. The, the way the Bible was copied, all the manuscripts were copied at the time were by hand, mm -hmm. and then the teachings of the copyist would often be reflected in the modification he would make to the text. He, he would mm -hmm. say, oh, it couldn't say that, because that doesn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. So so he would put in a word or two here and there, and uh, now it makes more sense to me, I can get that now. And then the next copyist would do the same, and the next copyist would do the same. And then, of course, there were many emotions involved for, for many of the so-called priesthood or the ministers of, the, of mm -hmm. the faith that got incorporated into those copies. And, and by 300 years later, there was a gross distortion of what I really taught yeah. incorporated into the so-called canon. Yeah. So there's synoptic gospels, as they're described, yep. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Yep. They were written about 40 years after your death, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And John about 60 AD. Yeah. Which of those is possibly the more accurate? Well, they all contain inaccuracies, unfortunately, because um, because what the way in which the, the original texts were actually quite accurate account, uh, recount, accounting. So, so for example, I, I only met Luke once in my life on earth, and he was only six years of age. So when Luke um, put together his gospel, he was actually going by first-hand interview experiences with other people who he, he went back to Israel to interview. And of course he had the first-hand uh, account available for, of Mary, my, my partner, Mary Magdalene. So, because Mary, uh, he married my daughter, um, Luke married my daughter Sarah. So he had the first-hand experience of my, of my soulmate to, to get a lot of his material. So what he wrote was relatively accurate at the time. However, that also got distorted through this process of copying revisionists and so forth. So what they originally wrote was quite accurate, but but unfortunately, due to the changes that were made and so forth, by the time the Council of Nicaea came along, there were already quite a lot of strong distortions as well. And the, the three synoptic gospels, the theologians have said that they're possibly, the three of them were copied from another source, which they call Q. Yeah, which is actually my soulmate. <laughs> Explain. Well, Mary was still alive, and Mary was the person who knew the most about my teachings that I gave while I was on earth and and but but there were a lot of problems that the the disciples around her had actually exposing to the world that she was still alive because because the Roman army was still on the lookout for Mary, they wanted to kill her still, they wanted to kill my child and so and so the disciples all were trying to keep Mary's identity and also oh, safety okay. uh, in play constantly. And so what, what that meant was that Mary, who had the most widest knowledge of my life and also the greatest knowledge of myself and my own personality and so forth, mm. um, knew these other disciples, of course, knew Matthew, knew Mark and even knew Luke because she, he, she was our son-in-law. Mm. And so um, all of these people could go back to Mary and actually get um, the material from her as just to, verbally did she write just verbally yeah okay. just verbally and get the material from her and and so that that is the source that it was the primary source of mm. information after my death about my life and what actually did happen mm. Mary was the primary source but of course that happens through a process of interviews and so forth with her and mm. you're spending time with her and finding out and, so how, and so forth. how long did she actually live she lived an additional 30, nearly 30 years after my passing. Um, and she was, she was tortured to death by the Roman army who eventually caught up with her in southern France. Mm. And she died in southern France, yeah. And this, as part of the persecution of Christians? Um, no, more a, gen more a specific focus on finding my partner, my, my, the person who I was married to. And why why did they have that issue when you were you were out of the way now you weren't stirring up the the pot 
Well, what the original feeling was of the Sanhedrin was at the time of my passing was that if they killed me, then the whole movement would die off. Mm. And uh, and then after after quite a number of years, it was quite evident that not only was the movement not dying off, but actually it was growing, and that eventually became quite a concern to okay. the Roman power, the mm. Roman world power at the time. And so and so and it was also quite a concern to the Jews. Uh, the Jews didn't want that happening either. Mm. And so there were quite a lot of cooperative efforts in order to find Mary. Um, and to kill her, and also because it was rumoured that I'd had a child, there was this cooperative efforts to also to find my children and kill them as well. Yeah. And and your child was Sarah. Yep. And she survived. And she 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 was born after I, I passed. Obviously, mm. she she was born in Egypt, um, and uh, and then shortly after uh, she, shortly after her birth, uh, they were forced to flee from Egypt. And they fl 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 fled via ship to the south of France, via via um, the the islands, you know, Malta okay. and mm. Cyprus, and and through Sicily and so forth into southern. So France. there is something to this bloodline, is there? <laughs> uh, no, because no. what happened is that uh, shortly after the time of Mary's passing, both Luke and Sarah and their three children, my three grandchildren, all were murdered yeah. and, and nobody survived after that. So, What so, was the circumstance in, with that? Well, what happened uh, was that uh, Mary, who was by this stage, uh, so we're now talking 30 years after mm -hmm. my death, Mary by this stage was teaching again. She was teaching mm -hmm. uh, quite openly in the south of France. She had quite a large following. The Roman army, the Romans heard about, heard about this and uh, they they found they found her, and there was a few days' warning that they were going to find her. And Mary decided to stay behind. Mary decided to s just face the army rather than flee, because she'd probably she'd spent most of her life in hiding up to this point, and and was quite tired of fleeing. She was mm -hmm. quite she was in her fifties by this stage, um, so she was quite tired of fleeing and. But uh, Luke, the Sarah, Sarah, and the three grandchildren all—they um, were all still wanting to stay alive, of course. So they decided to flee. So they left southern France and went to Italy via by, by, by boat. Unfortunately, though, um, the Roman army were also told where they were, and on the boat, Luke and the three children were murdered, um, and Sarah actually survived. Uh, to old age, because they thought her eldest daughter was Sarah. So, so, so what had happened was Luke and Sarah had three children. Mm -hmm. Their eldest was a daughter, and when the Romans killed the four of them, the Luke and the three children, they thought the oldest child was actually his wife, and so they didn't pursue Sarah anymore. And Sarah went back to the southern France eventually. She had a very hard time in her life and went back to southern France. And she actually started the movement which, which now you would call the, the nun movement. Um, oh, okay. And it was very similar. She, she looked after children um, for the rest of her life, taught some of the truths about divine truth until her own death. And so she died of old age, but she never remarried and she never had more children. And that was the end of our lineage. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there is no, you know, sacred bloodline or anything like that either. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, at the end of the Council of Nicaea, mm -hmm. they put together the Nicene Creed, mm -hmm. which I was asked to say when I was in my early 20s as a member of the Uniting Church as a part of my confirmation. Mm, it's interesting how long it's lasted, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. And I read the Nicene Creed and I thought, well, oh, I can't really say that. <laughs> uh, because there were things that just didn't ring true for me. Um, and, and that would be the case, I feel, for many Christians, wouldn't it? If they actually knew the, the full authorised teachings of mm. their own religion, many of them would disagree with those authorised teachings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So...